Now that we've looked carefully at all of the individual visual elements, it's time to look at how they all work together within a photograph to make the image come together as a complete, finished piece that's visually interesting and compelling, if not beautiful. An artist's job is to figure out how to visually express the ideas that are circulating around his or her brain, and the tools that she's got to do so are all of those elements we've talked about already – line, shape, mass, color, light, etc. But ultimately, in order to give us something that both communicates what she's trying to say and give us something interesting to look at, she's got to organize all those tools into some kind of system. In two-dimensional art, we call that system a composition. In three-dimensional work, we call that system design. When an artist is figuring out how to organize or build the composition, she uses a common set of guidelines we call the principles of design. These guidelines or principles help the artist know what's working or what's not working within the artwork. The principles of design are a natural part of our perception, the way we see the world, but usually we're not conscious of them. Since artists have trained themselves to look at the world extra carefully, they are very aware of these principles. For artists, understanding the principles of design helps them make effective choices as they construct their work. For us, understanding the principles of design can give us greater insight into a piece of work. The principles of design that we most often identify are unity and variety, balance, emphasis and subordination, proportion and scale, and rhythm. You can discuss any work of art in terms of the principles of design, regardless of its form or the culture in which it was made. They are sort of the universal truths of art. If you look at a piece of work and you can't quite tackle the meaning of it, Look for these principles and see how they're at play within the work. Now photographers do two jobs. They, like other visual artists, express ideas circulating around their brains, but they also record objects and subjects that already exist in the world. In the last lecture, we talked about how you, as a photographer, need to train your eye to recognize visual elements and how they work together within the frame. Well, you also need to train your eye to recognize how these elements can work together according to the principles or rules of design. Because we as photographers do a slightly different job than other visual artists, we get additional rules or photographic principles of composition that help us to frame a compelling shot. These are harmony, contrast, framing, the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, these rules help us both process what we're looking at when we're learning to recognize a good shot, and they help us organize our subjects in visual space so that it makes sense and gives a maximum impact to our viewers. Just as I did in the last lecture, I'd like to walk you through these principles by examining and analyzing particular photographs. My goal is that by the end of these videos, you're equipped with the tools that you need to start honing your photographic skills. The first major principle I want to talk about is unity and variety. Unity is the sense in a work of art or a photograph of oneness or of things belonging together and working to make a coherent whole. It's that sort of intuitive impression, impression that when you look at something it just looks good or it looks right or it looks finished. Variety is the difference among the individual visual elements that provides visual interest to the piece. We generally talk about the two together because they usually exist together within a piece of work. A good way to think about it is to imagine a blank wall. If all of you came up to the wall and made a mark, we'd have a lot of variety. Your marks would all be different, maybe they'd be lines, maybe they'd be squiggles, maybe they'd be graffiti tags, but we probably wouldn't have a lot of unity because you all worked independently and made random marks that don't necessarily go together. Artists and photographers try to find the right mix of unity and variety within a given composition. If you look at this image by Guillermo srodek Hart, an artist that we looked at in the last lecture, you see a lot of different visual elements and objects of varying sizes, shapes, and colors. At first glance, this looks like a snapshot of a workspace, but if you keep looking and look carefully, you'll see that this is actually a very carefully constructed composition. If you notice the focal point of this image, it's a bike wheel. This is where our eye goes first, and this is what anchors the shot. Once you notice how this works within the frame, it's kind of put right in the center, then you can start to see how everything around it and behind it directs our eye to it. 
First, if you look at lines created by the tools behind it, we've got diagonal lines that kind of frame it coming from this direction. We've got vertical lines that point toward it, horizontal lines that point toward it, vertical lines that kind of give it its own frame here. And then you also have implied diagonal lines by all these piles of things here on, on the table. They kind of go this way towards, towards the wheel, they come in from this direction, and they kind of sit along this front foreground here to let us know that there's a little bit of space and depth in the frame, but this is what we're supposed to be looking at. And you also see a really interesting distribution of color, mostly red and blue, that kind of echo the blue color of the wheel itself. We've got these blue strips along the back, the blue sign that kind of sits right behind and off, off the left of this wheel here. You've got various blue wrench handles, and then you've got the reds that kind of come in from this direction too. So everything kind of brings us, brings us home here to the middle. And the bike in the center here not only gives us a sense of visual unity, you know, it kind of links everything, you know, it kind of links everything together here, but it also gives meaning to the piece as well. It locates us, the audience, and it helps us understand what we're looking at. This image here by Jim Goldberg is an example of what we call conceptual unity. Goldberg has shot a collection of objects with an isometric perspective so that there's not a lot of contextual information and everything looks kind of blank or flattened out. It looks at first glance like a drawer full of junk, but again, if you look carefully, you start to see that the objects are all objects of no good. We've got pagers, guns, lots of knives, a shiv, um, a doorknob on a rope, um, lots of kind of no good, good objects. And so you get a sense, you begin to get a sense that these are related somehow. And what this is, this image is actually a drawer filled of confiscated items from a jail. So what Goldberg has done here is he's used the idea of contraband to unify a collection of random objects. As you look for interesting shots, you can also think about conceptual unity as a good strategy for organizing your visual information. Balance is the next major principle of design. If an artwork or a photograph is balanced, it looks good or it looks right. If it's not balanced, it looks off. A lot of times when we assess and talk about the balance of a piece, we talk about the visual weight of the forms and the shapes within the composition. Visual rate weight is the relative heaviness or lightness of the forms in a composition, and we gauge it by how those forms attract our attention. When the visual weights of the forms is equally distributed throughout the composition, the piece feels balanced. This right here is a very famous photo of Muhammad Ali taken by Neil Leifer. Visual weight has a lot to do with what makes this such an effective composition. You can see here that Ali has just delivered the knockout blow to his opponent. And we as the audience get a palpable sense of the gravity of the photo, which was Ali's victory over Sonny Liston, because of how heavy Liston appears here at the bottom of the frame. He's lying across almost the entirety of this bottom portion of the photograph right here. And he's a dark body in dark shorts and dark shoes against the white background of the ring. Towering above him is Ali in his light shorts that echo the kind of vertical line here of the ring side. And together, these two bodies, if you look from top to bottom, together these guys form a big triangle, a big heavy triangle that kind of roots us to the photo and lets us get a sense that we're a part of the action. There are two types of balance that we talk about in a composition, symmetrical and asymmetrical. With symmetrical balance, the forms in a composition mirror each other along a central axis, or an imaginary line that cuts the picture plane and divides it in half. This image by Zeke Berman is a good example of symmetrical balance. If you follow this line here, which divides the frame in two, you'll notice that the objects he's placed on either side of the table mirror each other in size and shape. This cup and this cup, this hand and this hand, this bust and this um, box of, of, of ceramics, this hand and this hand. The objects aren't perfectly symmetrical, they're not, you know, exactly the same size, but because they mirror each other and because those weights are similar, it reads as symmetrical balance. 
asymmetrical balance happens in a composition when two sides don't match exactly as mirror images, but the visual weights of the objects or the forms in each half are similar. They're either similarly light or similarly heavy. Because the visual weights are similar, the composition feels balanced. If we go back to this image by Jan Groover that we saw in the last lecture, you can see that the dividing line of this one, which I'd argue is, is this line here, is off-center. So symmetrical balance is impossible. But what she's done here is used this bottle, which is light, um, to e kind of even out the weight of this bottle, which is big and heavy, by encasing it in this metal frame. So because these visual weights are similar, the piece feels balanced. More often than not, photographers shoot subjects that they find interesting or that they want to draw our attention to. Emphasis is a design principle that allows us to draw our viewers' attention to particular parts of the composition. When an artist or a photographer places emphasis on a small, clearly defined area, we call that area the focal point. When an artist or photographer intentionally makes certain parts of the composition less visually interesting so that other parts stand out, that's called subordination. The biggest, easiest tool that photographers have at their disposal to place emphasis on a subject is depth of field. Placing certain components of an image in focus while leaving others out of focus naturally creates emphasis and subordination of the subject matter. In this image by Amy Stein, you can see immediately how she's used a shallow depth of field to place emphasis right on the barrel of that gun. The gun barrel is in crisp focus, while the figure holding it and the surrounding landscape are out of focus. It's the first and almost only thing we actually see. There's no mistaking that that gun barrel is the focal point of the image. So what do you think that this image is about? Why do you think that the gun is so important, but the sh person shooting it is not? In the last lecture, we looked at this image by Donna Ferrato, and I talked about how she upends our expectations as viewers because she plays with the figure-ground relationship within the composition. Again, here she uses focus and depth of field to place emphasis on the woman on the couch and not on the figure at the foreground. Looking carefully, we, can, we know that this person is a police officer. What do you think Ferrato is trying to say by making the woman more visually important than the police officer? Emphasis and subordination not only play a role in visual organization, but they also help define the photographer's point of view and they help give meaning to a piece. Another big principle of design is size, because, as they say, size matters. When we talk about size in art and design, we talk about proportion and we talk about scale. Scale means size in relation to standard or normal size, and normal size is the size we expect something to be based on what we know about it. So for example, we know that a model airplane or a toy truck is smaller in scale than its natural size, a real airplane or a real truck. Likewise, a giant pumpkin that you might see at the fair or the farmer's market is larger in scale than a regular old pumpkin you buy at Trader Joe's. In this famous image by William Eggleston, you can see that he delights in playing with the scale of objects. Here he shot at a perspective or a point of view that's close to but lower than the tricycle. This is the idea of forced perspective that I mentioned briefly in the last lecture. What he's done is he's confused our expectations of scale. Clearly, a tricycle is much smaller than a house, but by using this forced perspective, he gives us the appearance of the tricycle being much larger in scale than the houses behind it. It also helps to emphasize the tricycle. Proportion refers to size relationships between parts of a whole or between two or more things that work together as a unit. Proportion plays a big role in defining the space in this image by Stephen Shore. Here we get a sense that the space is confined and it's crowded because we have a collection of visual clues relating to proportion. This truck end is bigger than this building, and this building is bigger than this truck, and this truck is bigger than this car, which is bigger just sort of barely than this pallet here. 
Looking for size relationships among your subjects is a great way to help you make sure that you have a good composition. The last universal design principle I want to talk about before going over some principles that are specific to photography is rhythm. Rhythm is based in repetition. We talk about the rhythm of the seasons, the repetition of the seasons. We talk about the rhythm of music, the repetition of beats and phrases, etc. Through repetition, any of the visual elements we've talked about so far, line, shape, mass, etc., can give a work of art or a photograph rhythm. In this image, David Burdney shot these dock pilings in such a way that they repeat out into the horizon. That repetition of shapes combined with a low contrast, muted color palette help give this image a calm, if not melancholy, rhythm. Likewise, in this image by Ed Ruscha, he's given us several frames within the composition that work together to form a grid, and within that grid, he repeats the image of a gas station. This rhythm is a lot more dynamic than Burdenese, but it's almost as if we're running around in circles because there's so much sameness. And in fact, that's exactly what Ruscha is after. He was preoccupied by the sameness of suburbia. Because in photography we're learning how to train our eye to recognize spatial relationships that define a good composition, instead of creating those relationships by hand the way we would in painting, drawing, or sculpture, we've got an additional set of principles or rules to follow when we're actually out in the world looking for the perfect shot. These rules are derived from the basic principles of design that we've talked about already, and in most cases they're combinations of different design principles. Our first rule, harmony, for example, is a combination of rhythm and movement, unity and variety, and balance. Harmony occurs when you've combined similar visual elements throughout the frame. Some elements you can use are color, shape, and texture. In this image by Sandy Skoglund, you can see harmony in the ways that she's used colors and textures. The blues of the bedroom work together against the oranges of the fish in a complementary color relationship, and the sort of floaty texture of the fish stands out against the smooth textures of the furniture. You can see also how the rhythm or the movement of fish against the static tableau-like background kind of keeps our eyes moving all over the frame in sort of a circular way. Here, in a piece by Julie Blackman, you can see how closely harmony and balance work together in a composition. There's harmony in both the lush greens of the grass and the tree against the empty blue sky, and there's harmony in how she's used the beige colors of the little girl's dress, the pram, the woman's dress, and the bag right at the foreground. And what all of these things do is provide a counterbalance to the lone, darkly clad man to the left of the frame. The visual weights of all of these subjects more or less add up to the one of the man. Knowing all of that, what do you think this image is about? What does it mean? We talked briefly about contrast in the last lecture series when we talked about the grammar of photography. Contrast is one of the most fundamental and most important rules you can follow. To make an image expressive, you need a little bit of conflict or contrast between and among objects in the frame. In the last lecture, we talked about value contrast, which is the contrast between light and dark objects, and we talked about color contrast. But you could also focus on psychological state contrast or physical condition contrast, which you see here in this diagram. In this detail of an image by Irving Penn, which we've seen before, you can see how he's really pushed value contrast to its maximum, giving us maximum ten tension or conflict within the image. The contrast is so extreme that the model's skin is virtually the same value as the background. So what happens is that she disappears, and what we're left to focus on is the clothes, and in particular the richness of them from the plush velvet of the hat and gloves to the shiny satin of her dress and the delicate lace of her veil. That tells us that this image is not about the woman, but rather about the clothes and how they define her. In this iconic image by Cindy Sherman, you don't see a lot of extreme value contrast. This is what I would call a medium contrast image. 
but you do see quite a bit of psychological contrast in the buildings towering over her as she's looking uneasily up to up and to her left. With this image, you get to experience the subject's anxiety. Another type of contrast we talk about is conceptual contrast, where your expectations as a viewer are overturned and you're caught by surprise. You can certainly see that here in this piece by Elliot Erwitt. He's captured a live drawing session. Now ordinarily, we'd expect the subject to be nude and the students to be fully clothed, but here, the students are naked and the model is fully clothed. It's alarming and also really, really funny. <laughs> Being mindful of contrast is so important to making a great picture. Framing, or keeping your eye trained to look for opportunities to shoot a frame within the frame, is a good way to give emphasis to your subject matter. Here's another image by Elliot Erwitt, and you can see how he strategically captured the car window in such a way that it frames both the little boy and the spider web of broken glass. Got one frame here that takes the whole thing in, and one second frame here that isolates the broken glass. The way that he's used framing emphasizes both the boy and the broken glass, and that signifies to us, the viewer, that the two are equally important to the overall story. What do you think this story is? The last two principles I'm going to talk about are the rule of thirds and the golden ratio. Both of these have to do with how you organize objects and spaces within the rectangular frame of the viewfinder. If this were a studio photography class, we would spend a lot of time on these particular principles and the several sort of sub-principles that come from them, and I'd probably give you lots of exercises to do simply to practice getting familiar with them. But since this course is meant to be more of an overview, I'm going to stick to the basics. The rule of thirds is typically the first rule you learn if you're a photography beginner. It's a very straightforward and natural way to subdivide the frame. What we do is we split the frame into thirds, producing a simple grid. And this is why the grid on your phone camera is so helpful. It does this math and the work for you so that your eye doesn't have to. The rule says to put the main subject into one of the intersections, and the good news is that you have four of those. One, two, three. Four. You also want to put important horizontals on the grid lines, things like the horizon that give us a sense of space and depth of the image. Going back to this image by A.B. Stein, if you put an imaginary grid over this image, you can see that the driver and the truck itself are positioned in intersectional areas, and that the horizon line, which lies somewhere behind the truck, sits along the top horizontal line of the grid. The rule of thirds is a classic way to organize landscape, and it's been extremely important to Western art history. The golden ratio has a long history in Western civilization, and you've no doubt heard about it in either a math, a philosophy, an art history, or another art class. We won't compute it mathematically here, but what we will do is we'll look at a few derivative compositional tools. The golden rectangle, like the rule of thirds, splits the frame into a grid, but not a grid split into equal parts. They're closer to the center. This grid originates from natural proportions prevalent in nature, including the human body. The golden triangle has actually nothing to do with the golden ratio at all, but it is an easy way to come up with guidelines that divide the space. Draw one diagonal from corner to corner, and draw two lines from the remaining corners so that they make a 90 degree angle with the main diagonal, forming four triangles as a result. This rule more or less helps you divide a space, and it's less steadfast than it is just helpful. The golden spiral is a mathematical rule that more or less describes how all of the natural world is organized. It's a self-repeating spiral shape with a constant growth ratio. When you use this rule, objects in the frame should roughly follow the spiral, and the main subject should be closer to the small twisting point. If you look carefully at this image by Jeff Wall, and imagine the golden spiral laid on top of it, 
you can see that the man is sitting just about at the point where you've got the smallest twist. And then all of the object clusters, the clothes hanging, the light bulbs hanging from the ceiling, and the sink area sort of spiral away from him, while the less dense, more open space occupies what would be the more open space in a nautilus shell. It's not exact, but it surely helps reinforce the sense that the man is contained in a tightly defined claustrophobic space, much like a snail sits in his little shell. Now you should be ready to go out and shoot. The first assignment asks you to synthesize all of this information and challenge yourself to find shots that are well composed. You can shoot anything that you want, but we'll be looking to see lots of experimentation in your shots. Challenge yourself to look for interesting visual elements and spaces, or places where you notice some of these rules in play. This is an exercise in looking as much as it's an exercise in taking pictures. Good luck!